Okay, well, uh, continuing on this theme, I want to discuss uh, supersymmetry, but this will be n equal one supersymmetry. I want to look at the low energy particle physics that can be associated with such a thing. And uh, I will talk within the framework of a specific theory, the so-called uh, B minus L theory, which I'll describe in a minute. But much of what I'm going to say is not very specific to this B minus L theory. Some is, some isn't. I just want to basically discuss supersymmetry and uh, possibly what you could see and what you would have predictions at the next run at the LHC. Okay. Of course, this is a, during a conference on 60 year of Yang Mills uh, gauge field theories. and. Uh, there is very much a relation here. And now you, this was pointed out to me by Julius Fess, uh, a uh, close friend of mine and, and a mentor of mine. And uh, he always made this point, and I considered it, I think it's very valid, and it really makes sense within the context of this conference. So it was pointed out uh, earlier today in a number of talks, uh, quark was found to be in a triplet under SU3 color symmetry. Uh, where you had uh, eight generators, T of A, of SU3. And initially, it was a global symmetry where these parameters, whoops, I knew I would do this, where these parameters uh, were all space-time constants. <laughs> However, as David pointed out today, it seems uh, somehow taking the whole universe and rotating it at the same time in the same way seems a little extreme and maybe violates causality. So one would expect, in fact, that this, uh, you should gauge this symmetry by taking that these, these not to be constants, but to depend on space time. And when you do that, this leads to the existence of a Yang Mills gauge field, uh, A mu. Uh, it couples in a minimal way, and it satisfies a particular Lagrangian. So this is the beginning of, of uh, the Yang Mills theory. So the strong interactions of the standard model are mediated by SU3 Yang Mills gauge fields. So we know that that's true for uh, SU2, chiral SU2, and so on and so on. We get the standard model, as we heard about all, all morning. Okay. However, now let's suppose that uh, the LHC discovers something new, which I really hope it does, uh, discovers that a quark is actually a component of another kind of multiplet, uh, a chiral multiplet, in which uh, a quark is associated with some scalar field phi and a scalar field f. That's an auxiliary field, but be that as it may, it's associated with two scalar fields. Uh, and they mix into each other under another global symmetry, this one called, geez, supersymmetry. See the whole talk in advance. Okay. Um, and again, when you first do this, it'll be, it seem to be a global symmetry where the parameters of this theory, which now are uh, two component spinners, uh, will be space-time constants. However, these generators, I have to point out, have a funny closure. They close uh, not into, the, uh, into themselves, but into a vector, and in fact, it's the vector of translations. So once again, it's compelling to gauge this symmetry, for the reasons I said before, by taking these spinners to depend on space time. But if you do that, since the P mu generates translations, this implies the existence of, I'll call it, a, 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 a Yang-Mills gauge supermultiplet, which has gravity in it, a gravitino, and then two auxiliary fields as well which, as before, have some minimal coupling. So here's a gravitino coupling to a quark and then coupling uh, to a scalar. And you can then write down uh, the simplest uh, Lagrangian for this, which just turns out to be gravity, in this case, supergravity. So the conclusion of this, and again, Wes used to point this out to me all the time. He would say, well, you know, people are always talking about the hierarchy problem as being important. But one thing that's important is that if global supersymmetry is to be discovered, it will probably be gauged. And thus you get, uh, you intimately relate particle physics with supergravitation in a way which is very, very cl clear. It's, it's just another Yang-Mills theory, if you like. So I think this is a very important point. So having said that, let me discuss a uh, theory. I don't want to push this theory as being the, the theory of nature, but it gives a context for low energy supersymmetry particle physics. So I'm going to use this. I work within the context of the SU4, uh, SU4 heterotic compactification in the heterotic string that David Gross and collaborators uh, originally described. 
Uh, it's in 10 dimensions. You have to compactify six of those dimensions in a special way, a so-called kalabi al manifold, so that you retain n equals 1 supersymmetry in four dimensions. You also have a gauge connection associated with this, and that has to be very special. It has to uh, be a connection on what's called a slope-stable vector bundle with slope, with vanishing slope. This theory also, and, and you need that, and also, and also to in order to preserve n equal one supersymmetry as well. You have to have holes in this manifold so that you can wrap so-called Wilson lines around the holes, and in this case, Z3 cross Z3 Wilson lines. What's the effect of this kind of string theory when you compactify down to four dimensions? Well, in four dimensions, you find that the original E8 that this theory would have had breaks down to a spin 10 grand unified theory. And when you turn on these Wilson lines, it breaks it further, uh, as I'll show in a moment. These Wilson lines, I'll take the generators to be B minus L symmetry and the uh, diagonal part of a, of a uh, SU, SU2 right. These are natural generators in this context. I won't go into it in this talk, but they're natural generators that arise in the Cartan subalgebra. We'll call that the canonical basis. But the, but the bottom line is, when you have the gauge connection with the Wilson lines, it spontaneously breaks uh, E8 to spin 10, and then that's broken down to the standard model, SU3, SU2 left. But you have a U1 cross U1. You get an extra U1 in this case, because Wilson lines are abelian. It has to leave an extra abelian U1. Uh, we will take this not to be hypercharged, but in fact to be uh, the diagonal 3 right and B minus L for reasons I'll discuss in a moment. But you could think of it as hypercharged. It doesn't make much difference. The reason I bring this theory up is that when you look at the zero modes of the Dirac operator on this, that is the low energy spectrum, it turns out to be precisely the, uh, the standard model, the standard supersymmetric model of, of quarks and leptons. But it also, all, each family has a right-handed neutrino uh, chiral multiplet that, that's involved. So it's almost exactly the standard model, uh, but it has right-handed neutrinos in it, and then it's supersymmetrized. We also get one pair of Higgs and Higgs bar. And supersymmetry, you can't complex conjugate uh, Higgs uh, in order to, to get down quarks to have mass or downfield fermions to have mass. So you have to have a second Higgs. And this is the minimal case, and that's also what we get. So this is a pretty good theory. Just to re recapitulate, we get uh, precisely the fields of the minimal supersymmetric standard model, uh, with, but we have a right-handed uh, neutrino supermultiple in each family, one pair of Higgs and Higgs bars. We have no vector-like pairs, no exotic particles. So this is an interesting theory. I don't, again, want to push this as the theory. There are other theories in other contexts which, which have their own uh, benefits to them. But this is, it's worth talking about physics here because this looks very close to what we know about nature and what minimal supersymmetry must be. Just as a technical remark, uh, each of these particular multiples comes from a different spin 10 representation projected out by the Z3 cross Z3, and therefore their soft parameters are not correlated by the grand unified group. So there were many U1 cross U1 generators I could have chosen such as hypercharged B minus L. Why did I choose the ones that I did? Uh, and that's because we can prove a theorem that uh, the only basis with a, a U1 wide and a U1 wide 2, uh, where there's no kinetic mixing either initially or when you scale down in the renormalization group is precisely T3 right and B minus L. This aids the calculation infinitely, so we, uh, we use this particular basis. However, be my guest and rotate it at any given time that you want, and you work in any basis you want, and you'll still get the same physics results at the end. Okay. So, what we want to do here is discuss um, this low energy physics of this theory. We know we have spin 10, but now it's going to get broken by Z3 cross Z3, uh, which have a 3 right generator and a B minus L generator. It matters a little bit uh, which one happens first. You have each Wilson line has a mass scale associated with it because you're wrapping uh, on an internal uh, cycle, and the cycles can have different radius. Um, so you have three possibilities. Essentially, the Wilson lines have the same scale 
one Wilson line is bigger than the other, like B minus L bigger than T3 right, or vice versa. It turns out that this result doesn't matter too much which of those. We've done, analyzed them all, and, and the kind of physics I want to talk about occurs in, in a lot of these. Um, but we'll pick one of them for specificity in a moment. So here's your spin 10 theory. If, for instance, the B minus L Wilson line turns on, you go through a left-right model, where from string theory, you can continue to compute the spectrum exactly here. And then when, three, uh, when the three-right Wilson line turns on, um, we'll call that the intermediate mass scale. That's what's going to matter to us. And that breaks us down to this MSSM-like model with an extra U1 B minus L, exactly the standard model three families, and each family with the right hand, it's neutrino. However, if the three right turned on first, followed by the B minus L, you could go through the so-called pati salam model with its exact spectrum. You can compute this whole deal. But when it, the second one breaks, when B minus L turns on, you then go down to the essentially MSSM with an extra B minus L and the standard model uh, super families. OK, so what does this theory actually look like uh, if you take this and scale it down in momentum down to low energy, uh, low energy scales where the LHC is operating now? I claim there's a great deal that sits there waiting to be seen. We'll either see it or we won't. But it's not something uh, I think the experiment matters. After all these years of talking about supersymmetry and so on, we finally get to a point where experiment can decide. So let's, let's decide. So what would these theories predict? Well, for instance, up at this scale MI, remember that's after both Wilson line turns on, you're sitting at this scale. It's going to be somewhere between about uh, th three, four, five times 10 to the 15th GeV and 16, 10 to the 16th GeV, depending on how you choose uh, the, this situation. You have a supersymmetric uh, super Lagrangian and you have soft breaking terms. Uh, in string theory, these would come from moduli and finding minimum for the moduli and computing uh, spontaneous supersymmetry breaking. But I'm not going to do that here. We're just going to allow ourselves to pick these soft terms statistically by scattering uh, on a computer statistically over a range, as I'll discuss. You have soft mass terms. You also have gay genome masses. You have soft cubic terms. And there's a Higgs-Higgs bar piece as well. And there's a lot of stuff I'm leaving out here. but. These are the main things I'm interested in. Now we have an extra U1 B minus L. We have, we have an extra symmetry, U1 symmetry. So we have to get rid of it somehow. It's not observed at low energy. What happens? Well, we take the renormalization group, huge calculation here. But remember, we don't have any kinetic mixing. We take this guy and we scale it all the way down. And what we find is that, and I will show you the statistics of this thing shortly, we, fi we find that Without any problem at all, we find that the right-handed neutrino, and we can always choose it to be a third family right-handed neutrino, actually can have its mass squared turn over from positive, which it starts out as, turns over as you scale down, becomes negative, and gets a vacuum expectation value for the third family right-handed neutrino. This has all kinds of implications. Uh, but well, let me, uh, let, let me show you some of them. So what happens when you get a VEV like this is it takes this U1 T3 right, U1 B minus L, and it spontaneously breaks it down to U1 of hypercharge. So when we're below this scale, we're going to have the standard model gauge group with U1 hypercharge in it. Okay. However, when you do this, when the neutrino gets a, a neutrino, the scalar partner of a neutrino gets a uh, vacuum expectation value, it has consequences. There's a discrete symmetry called R parity, which is required to keep, amongst other things, the proton from decaying too quickly. This happens to carry non-trivial R parity. So when it gets a VEV, you spontaneously break R parity. OK, that's fine, but it's going to have implications. And we're going to look at the LHC for those implications. So one can compute, since this is an exact theory, you can put in the VEV, expand around it. And you find that you get uh, the standard model gauge group with the standard model MSSM spectrum, the minimal supersymmetric standard model spectrum. But you also get some soft R parity breaking terms as well, um, which are very interesting. And in particular here, the details don't matter in any of this talk. They don't matter. 
But uh, I should point out that every one of these soft terms is proportional to the vacuum expectation value of the right-handed neutrino because that's what's breaking the symmetry. Okay? And that's going to really matter. It's going to have implications. OK, so having taken care of B minus L symmetry, because you might say, well, it's got an extra symmetry. What's going to happen? I will show you soon that not only does that spontaneously break, but it easily um, spontaneously breaks with, with uh, statistically very trivial that this should happen. Okay, and I will quantify that for you in a moment. So here we are up at this uh, B minus L scale. Uh, it is known that the B minus L boson or Z prime boson or the ZR boson, I mixed them up in my, my talk here, but the boson associated with that breaking of, B minus, of this, uh, the U1 cross U1 <laughs> has to be greater than 2.5 TeV at the moment. It's, it's already fairly high. So we're going to build this in. In fact, in this talk, I'm going to build in the present experimental values of everything. Okay. So then we scale down more. And as we scale down, we pass through what's called the SUSY regime. I don't have time to discuss it here. Let's just point out that the Yukao coupling for, for the top quark is by far the largest coupling, as people, few people have mentioned today. And therefore, the, the stops um, have, the, have the largest contribution. The stop masses have the largest contribution to supersymmetry here. So when the stops integrate out, that's when we'll say supersymmetry has integrated out. You have supersymmetry here and none here. Truth is, they spread out around that zone, as I'll show you. But that's usually taken as the SUSY scale, where supersymmetry integrates out. You continue to scale down further, and you find that electroweak symmetry, the Higgs, then develops a vacuum expectation value. Uh, there's non-trivial stuff associated with the Higgs doing that. It's well known in supersymmetry. That does happen. We will demand that the Higgs mass be the observed value of about 91.2 Jev. You also get a mild left-handed uh, neutrino here, uh, VEV, but it's so much smaller than electroweak lecture week that it doesn't affect any, anything. Also, you can compute in this process, once this breaks, you will get a Higgs mass as well. You can compute it many different ways. Uh, in this talk, I will use the, uh, renormal, the leading log improvement of one loop uh, renormalization group for it, but you can go to two loops, three loops, use fine Higgs, anything you want. We've done it different ways, but let me just show this at the moment. We will set the Higgs mass to be the atlas value at plus or minus two sigma of the atlas, atlas value, the present atlas value, which is given by that amount. For simplicity, we're going to choose this MI scale in such a way that in the zone between the grand unification scale and the MI scale, you actually focus the, the uh, gauge couplings so that you actually get complete grand unification. You don't have to, but then you have to build thresholds into the calculation. Makes it harder. So here, I will simply discuss the case when I uh, allow myself to uh, break the Wilson lines differently so that I can exactly grand unify. And you can do that, and here's the grand unification scale, 10 to the 16th. This MI is about 4 times 10 to the 15th, and we're going to discuss physics below it. Here's the unification value, uh, strong coupling unification, and so on. We then take all of this and we scale it down. You have to look at every sparkle and every, every squark and everything you want. And there's a lot of bounds already from previous LHC runs on these things, so I just list them here. And we build those all in. So we're not going to, anything where we start with initial values, which violates any of these things, we just throw it away. We're only going to keep things that satisfy all present experimental bounds. Uh, in fact, this is very good for, for fixing experimental bounds. We've actually, these are the ones computed by my collaborators and myself. I'll show you at the end of the talk. And as I said, we will uh, take the uh, atlas measured value of the Higgs uh, to within two sigma. There's a lot of constraints here, but let me just say 24 of them actually really matter. And so we're going to have 24 soft mass parameters. And what we're going to do is statistically give those initial parameters up at, at MI, or 10, half time, you know, 5 times 10 to the 15 GeV, and then renormalization group scale all that down, subject to the fact that it should be consistent with all known physics at the time being. And we're going to ask ourselves, what possible initial conditions can do that, if any? Okay. 
But in order to do that, we have to pick the initial values to scatter in. We're not going to pick specific values. We're going to pick a range. We're going to say that we have some mass m, uh, and we can be either bigger by some amount than that mass m or smaller by that amount. And we're going to scale everything in between them. This will be done for the soft scalar masses, the genome masses, and the cubic things. We're going to do this, uh, you can do this any way you like, and we've got a million different examples of it, but here I'm going to show you what happens if we demand that all particles, sparticles in the spectra be LHC uh, <laughs> compatible, that they could be seen accessible at the LHC. So we want all the sparticle masses to be lighter than 10 TeV. That's just an input I'm putting, I'm putting in here. Um, we're also going to choose this value of m and f in such a way as we get the maximal number of good points at the end of the day. We're going to just randomly do these things, run them down subject to all these, these experimental rules and see how many good points we get. So this just tells us when we ask what are the maximal number of points, we find if we take m to be 2.7 TeV and, and this uh, number to be 3.3, somewhere sitting in the middle there, we get the maximum number of really good points. But you could work anywhere here. We're not saying that, that nature picks that, but you'll get uh, the kind of results I'm showing everywhere, but this helps our statistics. So here's the kind of results you get. There's 24 parameters, but luckily, much of the renormalization group depends only on what's called SB minus L and SR, which are plus and minus sums of mass squareds. Uh, so we can always plot things in this two-dimensional space, remembering that some of the, these things are, in fact, each point will be degenerate in and of itself. And here's what happens. We start, we take in this uh, S, B minus L, and SR plane, we scatter this initial stuff up near 10 to the 16th GeV, and we scale it down. And the first thing we see is that a lot, is that a lot of these initial parameters do not break B minus L when they come down. Then there's a whole bunch that do break B minus L, but they're lower than the MZ Brown of 2.5 TeV. And then we see there's a whole bunch of these things which actually um, break B minus L and do satisfy the bound. So henceforth, I'm going to be working in this region. But you know, it's not obvious that you would satisfy them at all, but you do satisfy it, and you, and you get a lot of them that break B minus L, which was uh, something of a surprise to us. And in fact, you don't have to fine tune the initial parameters in, in order to do that. So the, the symmetry breaking above the 2.5 TeV bound is abundant. And you don't have to pick universal soft masses or any other special choices. So this is just a couple of examples of how you can get very scattered initial points and still break V minus L uh, above 2.5 TeV. So let's continue scattering uh, these things, and we now apply other bounds to them. Here's that green region that I was talking about, but now we'll also scale it down and demand that electroweak symmetry get broken. So all of this purple stuff, which, by the way, lies underneath, break electroweak symmetry, the Cyan stuff, uh, also satisfy all of the lower bounds. They overlie each other here. And then finally, the Higgs mass, the black stuff, also satisfies the Higgs mass. That is, the green stuff breaks uh, these two symmetries to hypercharge above the lower bound. You get 100,000 or so points. We started with 10 million points to scatter. Uh, we break SU2 cross U1 electromagnetism at the right value of MZ. Doesn't change much, 700,000 points. What about satisfying all of the sparticle lower bounds? Well, it drops down to uh, 270,000 points. And then when you apply the Higgs mass, you might have expected to get nothing. But in fact, we get a reasonably robust number of those. These are these black points, means you can scatter these things initially. You have a, a big space. And over a very wide range of that space, you have a lot of success. You, you have a lot of points which end up satisfying all the present bounds on particle physics. And you can analyze absolutely anything here. I will continue with these 58,000 acceptable. These are the black points. So for example, you can compute uh, the first and second family sleptons and, and the uh, left-handed neutrinos. And here are their masses. Not too surprisingly, they statistically cluster around two and a half. But they can also be very light. And that's important. You can, you can actually get very light sparticles here. We have a statistical analysis of it. I won't uh, present that here. You can look at stops, uh, light and heavy stop, for example, and you find these are their typical masses. 
and but you can get very light stop masses. I'll show you what that is in a minute. Um, if you look at MZ here, you find it's uh, again around, uh, it's between 2.5 and, and 6 TeV, so it's potentially observable at the LHC, uh, and so on and so on. So you can also calculate every particle mass in these things. So I just picked two points here, uh, giving an example of all the particle masses, all calculated from first principles given the initial statistical point. And this one is chosen because it has a neutralino lowest uh, LSP, and this one has a stop LSP. Uh, and it's important to this business. Normally, you have to get neutralino LSPs because of dark matter. They could sit there, and they better be neutral. Uh, however, we have our parity violation, and they can, uh, they can uh, decay. So they're not really LSPs. I don't know what to call them. You need to look at gravitinos, moduli, or, or uh, right-handed neutrinos as, um, as dark matter, but that's another, for another talk. But you can have neutral neutralinos, but you can also get color and charged e uh, LSPs, and that's what I want to discuss. So we can find out how many different LSPs we can have, and you see there's, a, there's the whole, whoops, I look backwards here. There's a whole range of neutralinos and, we, and binos and winos and so on, but you can also get charged stuff like stops and, and spotum quarks. And, and again, they're allowed now because uh, they're charged they can, and colored, and they can decay sufficiently qu uh, quickly due to the R parity violation. So let me close the talk with some low energy physics that you can compute from these things. The thing I like about this is I don't know if this model is correct or not, but it's a real model. It's specific. You can run the initial conditions. You can run them down exactly, and you can predict exactly what ought to be observable at the LHC. This particular model has B minus L uh, violation uh, spontaneously broken for the reasons I said. But any other models, string-inspired models, have their own set of interesting things. But let me discuss, let me discuss this B minus L case. So we're going to pick points. Uh, we're going to pick theories that ha uh, have uh, a stop LSP. There's lots and lots of such points. Uh, we'll pick a stop LSP. Why? Because it has color and, and charge, and therefore it's exotic as an LSP. Um, these left and right stops diagonalize. We'll take T1 to be the light mass, T2 to be the heavier one, and they have some mixing angle. And generically, you can ask with what the decays uh, via these R parity violating interactions are, as I showed you before. And they tend to be what's called leptoquark violations, either to a top or bottom quark. Um, however, when you have an admixture, which means that it's, it's not predominantly right-handed, but it's a mixture of left and right, uh, then in fact, it's the second channel that you, that you get into a bottom quark and a charged lepton. So here you have these gluons that we heard about today. So here's another use of, of gluons. They will um, decay into a, uh, into a stop and a stop bar, which then decays as a leptoquark. And in our case, it's going to be into a bottom, and, a bottom quark and a left-handed and a charged lepton. So we can completely compute everything here, like the partial width for the LSP decay. Uh, we made the assumptions in our analysis of prompt decays, which means that these decays occur within one mil in the, within one millimeter in the uh, in the um, atlas in the well atlas will do atlas chamber LHC chamber, and so they will actually see these. There's a lot more data about these prompt decays, so we restricted our results to that, and we can also compute the neutrino mass parameter a uh, mass matrix from this big job because all the neutralinos mix. And what we find is the following thing. Remember that the right-handed neutrino, third family neutrino, gets a vacuum expectation value. That leads to our parity violation, which then gives us the partial widths for these decays. But it's also true that the VEV of the right-handed third family neutrino goes into the Majorana mass masses for the neutrinos via a seesaw mechanism. So what we find, and what was amazing to me, and I, I think it's an interesting kind of result, which you don't expect, 
is that you get a direct relationship, calculable relationship between stop LSP decays, which might be observable uh, at the LHC, and the neutrino mass matrix and the mass hierarchy, whether it's an inverted or regular hierarchy, can be determined exactly. So again, let's look at the case of an admixture stop and what is the result here. This is what we find. We calculate the branching ratios uh, going into a bottom and a charged lepton, so it can be an electron or a muon or a tau. We'll plot it in the electron and the tau plane. Muon comes out toward you. And this is what would happen. If LHC, for example, were to discover such a decay, let's say over there, then just by discovering that decay over there, uh, you can immediately say that, in fact, the neutrino hierarchy, which is seemingly nothing to do, the, do with this, would it have to be in an inverted hierarchy. And more than that, you can actually measure which of the two possible values for theta 2, 3 um, uh, neutrino mixing angles you get. I would point out that there are uh, many uh, hundred million dollar and more experiments being done to determine these things, but LHC could determine it if this is the theory that we're talking about, because the right-handed neutrino, which leads to these, these uh, decays, will also tell you whether the hierarchy is inverted or normal. So such a point would be an inverted hierarchy, and the sine squared theta 2, 3 would be about uh, 0.587. That's one of the possible values. If you found a green point down here, however, it would still be an inverted uh, neutrino hierarchy, but the mixing, the th uh, theta 2, 3 mixing would be 0.446. So you can actually distinguish between them. If you, on the other hand, you ended up out here in LHC, you would discover these kinds of theories and you, you would discover that you had a normal neutrino hierarchy. And if you could tell the difference, which might not be easy to do, you can uh, tell whether you, what the uh, theta 2, 3 mixing angle is. So um, there's a direct relationship between these two, which I, we, we found very interesting. And finally, we can use these results, the fact that LHC has not yet seen them, to give lower bounds uh, on, the stop, um, on, on the stop LSP. And what we find is that the, the very lowest bound uh, comes from the places with the weakest data so far, and that would be about uh, 424 GeV. So the, and the bottom line of all of this is as I said, um, it's, this is, in some sense, you have a real theory. You can actually ask what its data is going to be, what LHC might want to look for, and so on. I think it, that one should take this stuff seriously and look for these things in various contexts. There's all kinds of interesting physics embedded here. And just to close, to repeat once again, this idea um, of supersymmetry and once again, I'll just speak for my good friend Julius Vess he used to tell me all the time. He would say, "What? Well, look, if you discover this, you have a global symmetry of particle physics. But we know, and we know now more than he knew even, that these things are gauged. That's what the standard model is. If we gauge supersymmetry, you're going to get gravity, and you're going to understand really why gravity is part of particle physics, and that's important. Thank you. Well, we are. Cosmological constant. And I know I've asked you this before. So I mean, one of the reasons I feel uneasy about this kind of game is that principle, you could calculate lambda. And what 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 gives you hope that you would get anywhere near the unbelievably small value that's observed? Well, there's, there's two, two things there. Uh, the cosmological constant problem is hopeless, and I hope the new generation just goes out and solves it, OK? But as far as getting to normal cosmology as practiced by our colleagues, we do very well in this theory. We've actually worked this out. Let's call this neutrino inflation. Okay, it was first introduced by John Ellis, but we're also doing it. You get, you get flat directions here which tend to flatten everything out, which is the key to this. So you get small scale, smaller than you'd think. So you get a D flat direction, 
F lat directions, and then F lifts a little bit. You get a little bit of an F term with small Yukawa couplings because it's a right-handed neutrino. So we get a very small roll down here. And when we plug this into the present uh, Planck and uh, Planck data, for example, we can, we can fix the data. We need to put in the renormalization group improved running coupling, but the tentative answer might be wrong. At the, but at the moment, we get very good uh, match to the, the present data for inflation in this case. But we still get a huge cosmological constant of you know, 100 billion electron volts or followed by you know, 100 million electron volts. And I don't have a clue how that gets hidden. Modified gravity, but you try to modify gravity, it's difficult. So I don't know. The, it's a great question. I don't know the answer.